Hi friends, I'm Chelsea Grayson coming to you once again from the office of the CEO. This is my show where I can help you be more successful in your current career and I can also help you successfully transition to a new career. So today I'm going to give you a brief and hopefully easy explanation of corporate structure. No matter what company you work for, it is some sort of corporate entity, right? So it's either a traditional corporation, it's a limited liability company, there's a bunch of different sorts of corporate entities it can be, and they generally all have the same corporate structure. And the reason why it's very important to understand corporate structure is because that's the power dynamic. Those are the people who are in charge of the company on a day-to-day -day basis and also short-term and long-term strategy and initiatives. So they're not just decision makers in terms of the company itself, but they're also decision makers in terms of your job, your future, your prospects at that company. And whatever happens to you at that company, of course, reverberates in the long term for your personal career path, no matter where you go after you leave that company. So it's very under important to understand corporate structure just in terms of the power dynamic and how it trickles down to you personally. So let's get started. So at the very top, there's the owners. These are also known as investors or more traditionally the shareholders. And this is true whether you're talking about a public company or a private company. And these people are different from lenders, for example, also known as creditors. So investors or shareholders have invested their money and they are risking that they're going to get either they could get a low return or they could get no return whatsoever. In fact, that disclosure is made to you when you invest in a company. You take equity or shares in the company and you risk not getting anything in return for that. Now, if you're a lender or a creditor, you have a lot more certainty, generally speaking, that you will get a return on that investment. You've lent the company money. It's at a very specific interest rate. And even, for example, if the company files for Chapter 11, there are priorities that a creditor or a lender is given, even over the shareholders of the company. Now, of course, the trade-off is that a, a shareholder stands to have a much more significant benefit or reward to the extent the company does very well, because a creditor, of course, has a very fixed amount that it's going to get paid back, and they don't get a lot of the upside that an equity holder or a shareholder gets. But that's the difference between owners and creditors. Right, so if you are a shareholder or an owner of a company, whether it's public or private, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that you control the company, that you have any decision-making authority over that company. Uh, it, logically, you have to have 51% or more of that company in order to actually control that company. And it's very easy in a public company, if you work for a public company, to find out who the controlling shareholders are and who the other big shareholders are, because both the company and those shareholders are required to disclose that ownership in various regular filings that are available on the SEC's website. If you just look under the ticker of your company, the ticker symbol of your company. So most shareholders have to disclose when they hit a 5% ownership, a 10% ownership, and most companies have to make a similar disclosure about who those owners, about who those shareholders are. And then of course, they'll list the, the big shareholders at the sort of the top five shareholders of the company. That's very easy to figure out if you work at a public company. And if you work at a private company, you're going to have to do a little bit more digging because there's nothing that requires for a private company to disclose who its shareholders are at all. That's the benefit of owning a private company. But you can reverse engineer a little bit because you can look at press releases that the company has issued over the course of the years or even um, announcement, other public announcements that it's made. And, you know, of course, there's going to be all sorts of press clippings that media and uh, news outlets have made about the company if it's done something that's headline worthy. So if the company has been bought and sold over the course of the years, if it's done financing rounds, so that's people investing in the company, um, that sort of thing is generally speaking disclosed in press releases or in other news outlets, and you can look those up. It's also perfectly acceptable to ask the general counsel if you can make an appointment to talk with the general counsel or even the head of your HR, look, what's the ownership structure of this company? They're not obligated to tell you, but they might be able to tell you and to the extent they know, it would be really interesting to get it from them. So going back to ownership and sort of how you control, if you're an owner that has less than 51% ownership of the company, you can you still might have a seat at the table where the decisions are being made and that table is of course the boardroom right and we are going to talk about the board specifically momentarily but back to being an owner if you have a contractual arrangement 
and this is generally reserved for people who come in and take a large ownership share. So maybe something less than 51%, but they have a big ownership share in the company and they will negotiate at the time that they purchase that equity to have some board seats. And again, these are normally corporate entity shareholders. Uh, so private equity funds or hedge funds or, or retirement funds, for example. So they aren't people themselves and they will designate individuals to sit on those board seats for them and make decisions that are consistent with that particular shareholders philosophical tenets right and the way that they normally like to see business getting done so you know but just because you have board seats again does not mean that you control what happens in the boardroom either right because so boards are normally an odd number of people so that you don't get caught in a stalemate or, or a deadlock right on a particular vote so you're talking anywhere from usually five people on the board to call it 11 those are really typical numbers so five seven nine eleven those are typical numbers of people that are normally on a board and typically speaking, you know, again, unless you're the controlling shareholder, you're probably not going to have more than one or two board seats. But at least then you've got a seat at the table. You can participate in the important discussions. You can hear what's going on so that you can report back to the shareholder that you represent and they can make their own decision about whether they want to continue to be a shareholder or not. And hopefully on the big important issues to you and the shareholder that you represent, you can go around the table and build a little bit of consensus. So even if you're just one of nine, if you could build consensus among at least five other, other four other members of the board so you can form a group of five, well, now you've got a majority of the board and hopefully you can, get to, can control that particular issue. So that is another way that a shareholder can get a little bit of control or power over a company, even if they don't have a controlling ownership share of the company. Now, you do want to pay attention to who sits on um so who sits on the board? And we're gonna to get to that momentarily when we talk about board membership, but I do wanna close out this issue of shareholders. So again, while the shareholders that have the biggest chunk of equity of the company are normally the ones that are gonna have the most amount of board seats, you should know that there are some shareholders who regularly decline to take board seats at all. And I am gonna make this a topic of another episode that I'll put up later on, but this is because sometimes sitting on a board carries with it certain liabilities and certain risks, and sometimes even has certain inherent conflicts of interest, so that if you feel like you have enough power behind the scenes as the owner of the company, as one of the big owners of the company, you might decline board seats because you don't want to expose yourself to that liability or conflict of interest. I'm going to give you one quick example and we'll go over this at greater length in a different episode. So again, if it's a public company and you as a shareholder are going to continue to actively trade the shares of that company, well, you can't do that if you have any material non-public information. So that's very important information that the rest of the shareholders out there, people who don't have board seats, just sort of the mom and pop shareholders of the company, if they don't have that information, you can't trade on that information. You have to cleanse yourself of that information by having the company publicly disclose that. And that's not always what everyone wants to have happen. Sometimes things are very privately discussed at a board level before they're ever publicly disclosed. You're not allowed to trade on that information, of course, because that's insider trading. So if you don't have a board seat, then you can help yourself not be privy to that information so you can continue to trade to a certain extent if you don't have a seat in the boardroom. So that's why some big shareholders don't want a seat in the boardroom. So let's talk now about one step under the owners, and that's the board. That is the board of directors. So this is, again, a group of folks who, generally speaking, are designated by the shareholders by virtue of the power of those shareholders. Now, there are typically there's at least one person who sits on the board just by virtue of his or her title at the company, and that's the CEO, of course. That's called an ex officio board position. It's usually in the contract of the CEO that no matter what, they get to sit on the board. But generally speaking, all the other people that sit on the board are there at the pleasure of the various shareholders that they represent. 
And everybody who sits on the board owes a fiduciary obligation, a fiduciary duty back up to the shareholders of the company. So again, this isn't just five or six folks. If it's a public company, this can be thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people that you owe a so-called fiduciary duty to as a board member. Fiduciary duty, just to break it down for you very simply, is a legal obligation to act in the best interests of another party, in this case, all of the shareholders. If you hold a fiduciary duty, you owe a fiduciary duty to somebody or a bunch of other somebodies, you are held to the highest standard of honesty and full disclosure, and you cannot obtain a personal benefit at the expense of the people you owe that duty to, in this case, the shareholders. So that goes a little bit to the liability that I was talking about a little bit earlier. It's a very serious thing to have a fiduciary duty with someone. And so you need to think long and hard before you take a board seat. Now there is directors and officers insurance that can cover some of that liability. So if you get sued for breach of, of fiduciary duty, you can fall back on directors and officers insurance, but that won't necessarily cover every instance and you're still going to be involved in a lawsuit if you get sued like that. So it is a very serious consideration before you decide to take a board seat. So the main job of the board of directors is to hire and fire the CEO. Very simple. And there's all sorts of other big decisions that a board makes. And usually those, the things that they are required to make decisions about are set forth in the charter documents of the company. So that's going to be the bylaws of the company and the articles of incorporation of the company. And those are all going to be publicly available because even if the company is a privately held company, those two documents generally have to be filed with the Secretary of State, um, wherever the company has been formed, whether it's a corporation or a limited liability company. But those other decisions, and those are things like whether or not to sell the company, whether or not to put the company into a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, really big high level decisions, those all pale in comparison, again, to the board's main and primary responsibility, which is to hire and fire the CEO. And I want to enforce that to you guys because a lot of people that I talk to don't understand that, yes, the CEO is the highest position you can have as an officer or employee uh, at, at, at the company, but even the CEO has a boss and that's, that's the board of directors. So the CEO, he or she has a set of bosses. Again, that's gonna usually be five to 11 people that they have to answer to. And that's some of the high pressure nature of being the CEO of a company is that you've got a panel of people that are your boss. <clears throat> There's something else that's very important that the board has to uphold, which is establishing tone from the top for the company. So that's just sort of what are the philosophical and moral tenets that the company is going to, what are, what are the principles that the company is going to operate under? What is the culture of the company going to be? And those are the things that are generally set at the board level with the agreement of the CEO, handed down to the CEO to then communicate and disseminate to the rest of the employees of the company. But I've seen it time and time again. If the board of directors doesn't establish that sort of tone from the top in terms of the sorts of principles and tenets, um, the culture that the company is going to abide by, and if the board itself doesn't sign on and agree to uphold that tone from the top, then the culture at the company it is never going to be very healthy and it can be very toxic because people are just sort of running around and don't understand how they're supposed to behave or what standard they're going to be held to. So that's a very, very, very important to establish tone from the top for the board of directors. You should know who the board of directors is, and this should not be something that anyone wants to keep private from you, right? So unlike the ownership structure, which at a private company, again, there's no obligation to disclose that to you. Um, you, even at a private company, you should be allowed to know who sits on the board of directors at any given time. At a public company, it's very easy to figure out. You just go on the company's website. There should be a little tab on the company's website that's called investors. And under that, aside from the financials of the company, the charter documents of the company, all sorts of other press releases that have been generated about the company, um, you will also see who the board of directors is and who the officers are at the company, quite frankly, as well. 
So you should take a look at who sits on the board of directors of your company because it'll tell you what your company is thinking about doing in the coming times, whether it's short term or long term. So for example, if your company has decided to put a bunch of people on the board that look like they have history in mergers and acquisitions, well, that tells you a couple things, right? Maybe your company is deciding to make a lot of acquisitions in the near or long term. That's how they're going to decide to grow. That gives you some ideas about that they are going to grow and that they're going to do it by acquisition instead of organically. Or maybe it tells you that the company is looking to potentially sell, right? Or sell a portion of the company, sell a division of the company, or maybe sell the whole thing. So it's very interesting to see mergers and acquisitions people sitting on the board. It's also very interesting, for example, if you see them all of a sudden ramping up in terms of technology folks, so people that are um, skilled in digital technologies or e-com platforms or streamlining e-com or maybe omni-channel expertise, well, that tells you a little something if you work at a retailer that they're probably intending to streamline their brick and mortar presence and probably intending to ramp up their presence online on the e-com platform. And that's very interesting as well, right? Because that tells you a little bit about what the strategy is moving forward. Or for example, on a darker note, if they all of a sudden start putting a lot of people on the board that have restructuring or bankruptcy or reorganization experience, people who have been at distressed companies, so those are companies that haven't been financially healthy or have themselves been put into chapter 11, that tells you a little something about the financial health of your company that you should also probably be gleaning from press releases and the various financial statements that come out. And it can tell you a little bit about where maybe the company thinks it's heading and maybe where the board thinks it's gonna really need help in the near term future. So that's why you should always have a really clear understanding of who sits on the board. Um, so even if you're just given a list of names because you're at a private company and they're not required to give you the bios of those people, come on people, we're in the age of the internet. It's very easy to do a deep dive, even just on LinkedIn, but there's all sorts of other ways to figure out who each of those individuals are, where else they've sat on boards, what they've done, and what their expertise is. And that'll give you a very clear guide in terms of where the company sees itself going. So just under the board is the C-suite. And the person at the top of the C-suite is the CEO. Now, why is this called the C-suite? I'm assuming you guys have heard this, this term before. So the C-suite is called that because most of the people sitting in the C-suite have the title chief before the rest of the title of their position, right? So CEO, Chief Executive Officer, CFO, Chief Financial Officer, COO, Chief Operations Officer, CMO, Chief Marketing Officer, CIO, Chief Intelligence Officer, um, CTO, Chief Tech, tech, um, Chief Tech Officer, right? So you might have a head of retail, you might have a head of wholesale, you might have all sorts of other folks with that in their title, depending on the nature of the business of the company that you are at. But anybody who's an executive vice president, generally speaking, sits in the C-suite and those are called officers. They're also called senior management and they're also called upper management. So C-suite, officers, upper management, senior management, executive management, it's pretty much all the same. And those are the people that have, if it's a public company, they have to be listed in certain filings as such. If it's a private company, it should be very easy for you just to sort of glean which of these people, and you can always ask the head of HR. They'll, there's no reason for them not to tell you who sits in the C-suite. And generally speaking, most companies have this denoted on their website as well. They want the outside public to understand who is in the day-to-day -day management, who makes day-to-day -day decisions for this company. And that is the C-suite. Because most companies are very proud. They've very carefully selected who sits in those positions. Those people have beautiful pedigrees. And this is a way of showing the public, you can be confident, you can have confidence in us. We deserve respect, we deserve your business because look at all these experts that are running our company day to day. Now the CEO, as I talked about earlier, reports to the board, that's his or her boss. The C-suite directly reports to the CEO. They do not report to the board. It's highly unusual for the rest of the C-suite to report to the board. And actually, if you've got someone like that, that is a warning sign that maybe there's a little bit of a lack of confidence in your CEO because they should all be reporting to the CEO. So if somebody has been able to negotiate directly reporting to the board, that might give you a little bit of 
insider information about what the board might intend to do with the CEO relatively shortly. So again, after you hit the C, after you get below the C-suite, now you're talking about middle management, then you're talking about lower management. So these are people maybe with the word director or manager in their titles, senior vice president, vice president, head of this, head of that. But again, if they don't have very specific C-suite titles, then they don't sit in the C-suite and they're either in middle management or lower management. And then there's, of course, all the rest of the people that aren't in management at all at the company, and they're part of the staff and administration of the company. One very important person I want to make sure and note to you that generally sits in the C-suite, um, because this is a person who's generally an advocate, can be a nice, helpful advocate for you as an employee, is the CHRO. That's the Chief Human Resources Officer. That's the head of HR, Human Resources. Now, this person is an employee of the company and they do serve at the pleasure of the CEO. So they are actually there for the company. So never mistake that they're actually your advocate, but it is their job to make sure that day-to-day -day relationships with employees run smoothly, that the culture of the company is the opposite of toxic, that it's a very healthy culture at the company. That's what they are judged on when it comes to whether they get a promotion or a bonus or whatever, right? So it is very important for them to have happy, healthy employees and to have good liaisoning and relationship with the employees. So they are a good person to go and talk to as an advocate, as a, as a person who has an in at the boardroom, they can help you understand what the company's initiatives are and they can even potentially if they get enough of you help communicate concerns or worries that the employee body has back up to higher powers right sitting in the boardroom and maybe back up to the owners so again it's not that they're an advocate for you it's not that they're necessarily on your side but it very much behooves and benefits the chro for you to be happy and for the employee body generally to run smoothly. So that is a tool that you can use and that's somebody that directly sits in the C-suite and has the ear of the board periodically. So hopefully all of that was helpful and I do intend to do a part two on this because there are just, there's so many components to corporate structure and there's also so many terms that frankly are a part of this conversation that I feel like most people don't perfectly understand that I do think it merits a second episode just specifically on this topic. So I'll put that together and I'll up the, upload that at a later time. So in the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and please join me again when I come to you from the office of the CEO.